You can see him on the table uh, right next. Oh, welcome to round four at Grand Prix Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, I'm Nate Price here in the booth with Jake Van Lunen. Uh, we are here featuring William Jensen, Hall of Famer, against Rob Renault. Huey is on uh, blue light control this weekend, playing uh, an archetype that he knows and loves. Anything that has islands and counter spells, he'll get behind. It looks to me with that Thassa that uh, Rob is going to be playing the Mono Blue Devotion deck that has been tearing up standard since the Pro Tour. Now, uh, Huey pretty happy to have found that land on the top of his deck. That's going to be very important. He can now cast the Divination that he has in hand and try to find more land. And if his opponent taps out for a big spell here, then he's going to get another Syncopate. Take some time. One, I think it's probably two copies of Divination main deck usually. Oh, the full four. He well, is he is playing Quicken. Good point. Drawing cards on your opponent's end step. That's that's some fun stuff. Quite strong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got to give himself the window or give his opponent the window to cast a spell here in order to continue to dig a little further deeper and find those lands. He did find himself a fourth land though, so and he's got at least one more copy of Divination in his hand, so he can always go digging a little bit further. But that window allows his opponent to uh, Renault to resolve a Jace Architect of Thought. Very, very powerful in these control matchups. All right. That well, looks like Huey fails to find his fifth land, so he's going to probably go back to the top of the deck, you think, uh, searching with his uh, divination to find that land, or do you think he's going to try to just use it? I think he's got to use the Tension sphere. sphere now. Okay. Rob did give him the opportunity to uh, hit it without actually gaining card advantage because he used the Jace to tick up instead of using it to draw cards in the mini factor fiction effect. Instead, he goes ahead and opts to try to find that land. And those two lands off of the top of that divination are going to be very, very important for him. He's already got the double blue he needs in play to start casting his spell. So those planes are just what the doctor ordered. Yeah, here, uh, I mean, now he's going to have to start dealing with the card advantage that's going to come from that Jace Architect of Thought on the other side of the table. But it's probably worth it when all is said and done. I mean, his hand is all a card draw spells, so. He does have two copies of... Uh, Sphinx's detention Revelation, sphere, right? De de uh, two Detention Spheres, I think a Sphinx's Revelation, and a Verdict. Oh, okay. Card in his hand. I thought he had two Revelations also. He might also. <laughs> but he'll be able to cast uh, a Sphere to get rid of the Jace, which again, pluses up instead of going for the cards. So he did give himself a, little bit, of a, a bit of breathing room in there, and he'll have the Syncopate back up just in case he needs uh, to fight for it. Rob continuing to tick up that Jace there. Is he just going for ultimate? He is just going for ultimate. All right. There's no fight. Jace finds a home in a detention sphere. Uh, Rob looks like he's got a copy of Nick, though, hiding there. Uh, it's one of the cards that's a bit divisive in terms of whether or not people play it in their mono blue devotion decks. Uh, although this looks like, is this the blue-black version of the deck? That is what it looks like. Yeah makes a little bit more sense in that version than it does in the straight blue. It's common to see zero, one, most copies in the mono blue version, but you'll see one or two uh, in that blue-black version. And in fact, he does have two. So what is the big difference between uh, running the straight blue version and the black version? What is getting the, adding the black to uh, the Devotion deck get you? Uh, Thoughtsies is the big card that people will want. Uh, I mean, being able to pluck a card like Sphinx's Revelation out of your opponent's hand when you're playing a devotion-based strategy is just so huge. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a card that you're playing that doesn't actually uh, work toward your devotion count, which isn't the best thing, but right. it just synergizes so well with those decks because those decks can just get blown out by single cards in a lot of situations, See. and you can just take the card that beats you out of your opponent's hand. 
Thorno gets in for another couple points of damage with his Frostburn Weird, uh, dropping Huey down to 14, and follows it up with another attempt at Athasa. Mm -hmm. Very unlikely that she sees play at this point. It looks like Huey's going to take advantage of the opportunity to draw himself four cards off of Sphinx's Revelation. Fill his hand Ooh, up. Ooh, nice. Up opportunity. Good word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Rich isn't here, so I've got to do my best to keep All on right. top of yeah, these yeah. things. <laughs> he uses this opportunity to draw four cards. Yeah, what can I say? Oh. Well, Fossil <laughs> will indeed hit play, but it uh, looks like she's going to be immediately taken care of with the second copy of Detention Sphere. So Huey's got a nice full hand now, plenty of land, so it would not surprise me to see some of these start to become the chaff he starts to discard. He is holding an Azorius Charm, which is an interesting card in this format right now. The card is a little bit weaker now than it was as things originally started out. Uh, how, how do you feel about that card right now, Azorius Charm in the current format? Um, I mean, it's it's not the best. It's like, It's pretty bad against a lot of the cards that you're going to be forced to play against. I mean, it's just... It's a card that doesn't interact well with voice. Um, however, I mean, in, as, in general, as a card, it's yeah. very strong. I mean, it, it has three very good modes, uh, one of which just allows you to cycle it. So if you ever don't need to, you know, put a creature on the top of your opponent's deck or, you know, sometimes lifelinking your team wins you the game. I mean, I use that mode a lot. Yep. Even right. in a deck like this. Well, it looks like a second copy of Jace is the attempt right now. Uh, Jensen's going to think a little bit. He still does have another copy of Syncopate in his hand uh, with enough mana that he could fight over it if he chose, chose to. And it looks like that is the play. Yeah, so uh -huh. coming in for another four here. Dropping negating the life gain by the Sphinx's Revelation and dropping Jensen back down to 14. Yeah, that's pretty good. And it looks like Jensen's holding on to an Elspeth, which is not going to be sitting in his hand for too much longer. Elspeth is one of the best Planeswalkers they've made in in a batch of very, very good Planeswalkers. All of her abilities are so good, and the ability to protect herself so strongly. Making three tokens the second she comes into play, she's going to hold the round perfectly against Rob's team. <laughs> Interestingly, Jensen's chosen to use the Owen Turtonwald uh, uh, counters, fe featuring that Mox Sapphire as a tribute to Owen's victory in the Lakers, or Vintage Championship, I'm sorry, a few years back. Yeah, he uh, he won the Vintage World Championships. Yep. Pretty impressive. Owen's very good at the older formats. Like, it's, it's funny, because we talked uh, the year that he won that, and one of the biggest skills, the most difficult skills to playing in that format, and something that's, like, very true is understanding how Brainstorm works, interestingly enough. Like, it's... It's surprising that a one mana blue instant could be the most difficult spell, well, the most difficult non gifts ungiven spell to play in a format, but it is. Well, I mean, Brainstorm is one of the hardest cards to play with of all time. Yeah. It, it might be, it might be the best skill tester we have in Magic. Yeah, which is one of the reasons that Jace the Mind Sculptor was so powerful during his time. For the players who knew how to play him well, he was just very, very difficult to beat once he got active. Yeah. So Renault gets a uh, Master of Tides into play, making himself three... Master of Waves. Uh, Master of Waves, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Making uh, three elemental tokens. I like how the the tokens are seahorses. They're made of the sea. Yes. <laughs> Horses made of the sea. I like that they're seahorse tokens and hippocamps in the same set. Well, it looks like Elspeth is going to suffer a hero's downfall. Another of the black cards coming in off of uh, Ronald's blue-black deck. And we're going to reset things. Jensen casts himself a Supreme Verdict. Leaves himself uh, four cards in hand, I believe. Six mana up. He's got an Azorius Charm, two Sphinx's Revelations, and a Plains in his hand still. It's quite a strong grip. It looks... Can't get quite a good look on how many cards Rob's got in his hand, but it looks like three more cards, including another hero's downfall. Now this time he's not going to waste any time, not plussing it or anything, just goes straight for the cards. 
the mini factor fiction gives him a cyclonic rift, which is going to. Yeah, it's a card that could actually do some work once he gets rid of the other two counters on his Jace. That way they don't just die when he casts it. The Mutavault is going to continue to do its work, attacking in for two. And now Huey really uh, finding other counter spells is becoming pretty important for him. Yeah. But with the glut of lands that he's got now, he finds himself able to <laughs> easily trade off one of his own Mutavaults. That was a bit of a mistake there on Rob's part, allowing, uh, allowing Huey to put him below seven lands in play by uh, blocking that Muta Vault. Now he's now, forced to draw a land in order to cast a Cyclonic Rift? Exactly. Uh, if sorry, he wants to overload. overload. Yeah. All right, and then Jensen's Muta Vault gets in and deals the rest of the damage required to get rid of Jace. All right. Rob refills his defense, beginning with another Frostburn Weird. Jensen just goes for the gusto, gaining himself five life, putting himself up to 19, and completely refilling his hand, giving him eight cards now. This is done at the end of Rob's turn, so he should be able to untap, draw his card, and have nine in hand. Plenty of time to make decisions and lots of mana available. Okay, so Rob decides to go ahead and just use that Cyclonic Rift. Giving him a faucet back. Oh, the options, the options. First comes Attention Sphere, resealing uh, Thassa underneath it. Elixir of Immortality. Just in case the game ends up going a little bit longer, an opportunity to reuse all those glorious, wonderful, powerful spells this deck contains. Also, no, no sort of split second existing in the current standard format, so Elixir of Immortality essentially uh, preventing Jensen from dying if he does take a lot of damage in a short period of time for some reason, which is pro probably not going to happen at this point. This is how this blue-white control deck runs. It is a control deck in every sense of the word. It just grinds games to a halt before eventually taking things over at the very end with uh, either Elspeth or Jace getting in with his Mutavaults. All right, Master of Waves comes in, makes five tokens, it looks like. Something that the Ratchet Bomb is going to be able to easily clear away if it decides it needs to. Jensen chooses to use Azorius Charm to send the Frostburn Weird back to the top of Renault's deck. Has the extra cards in his hand, might as well. Plus, if you're going to pop the uh, yeah. Elixir like he just did, might as well get some more value out of the cards in your hand. An interesting part about Elixir of Immortality, a lot of people look at it and don't really comprehend the power of the card. Uh, it really increases the, the power of your remaining deck by a pretty big portion. Since you no longer have the lands and the other permanents that you would have in play, you're just basically adding more good spells back to your deck? Exactly. I mean, once you have all the land you need in play, there's no reason to be uh, greedy. And Jensen, <laughs> he does have enough lands in place at 12, or am I miscounting? Maybe 13? All right, second Azorius Charm is going to take out uh, the Master and all of his little man along with him, uh, leaving just the Tidebinder Mage to get in for a couple of points of damage, which still fails to drop Jensen even back to his original 20 life. Uh, it looks like Rob's down to his last card in hand, and we know that the top card of his deck is a master, and that Sphinx's Revelation is going to give Jensen very likely all that he needs to uh, take control of this game. Right now he's just searching for an Elspeth. Now that uh, Rob's got a pair of two mana creatures in play. Looks like that Ratchet Bomb's probably going to tick up to two before blowing the world up. And there is that Elspeth. Yeah, with, uh, with Jensen at uh, 29, it's not looking like he's in any, any, in any sort of danger. No. He still has a lot of stuff in his hand as well. Got a copy of Dissolve as well as a Syncopate, so he's got that protection back up. 
It looks like there's a lot of counter magic in this deck for Huey. Yep. Oh, really? He didn't protect that with a Dissolve? And it's his only Elspeth as well, and he's only got one uh, Elixir, so... Looks like he is just fully in for the long haul here. <laughs> Settling in. Yeah. All right, opts to go ahead and trade off a couple of his tokens for the Tidebinder Mage before using an Azorius Charm to send the weird back to the top of Rob's deck. Forces him to commit a couple of mana to it, but he's had him locked under Azorius Charm for quite a while here. Like, last four or five turns, how many cards has Rob drawn that have been cards that weren't previously in play? Again, another unspoken kind of little hidden power of Azorius Charm, especially if you can get a lot of them going consecutively, is you just lock your opponent out of draw steps. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're putting your opponent's permanence on the top of their deck when they don't have any cards left in their hand, you have perfect information yeah. for more than a full turn cycle, and that's really, really powerful. It's a disheartening feeling, too, to know that like the card that previously wasn't doing too much to help you is now sitting on the top of your deck, so what's it going to do the second time around? All right, Jensen... Goes ridiculous and pads his life total in hand even more. Up to 37 life and probably an equivalent number of cards in hand. And there's that elixir back, so... I guess the fact that he's only running one of each of it and Elspeth is kind of meaningless when you're able to draw 15 million cards in a turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean... You just need to draw that Aetherling eventually. This is my favorite part about playing decks with lots of card drawing, is the end step, which of these seven cards are the most perfect ones for me to hold in my hand. Let me sort them out of this hand of 16 cards. I always feel like such an, a winner, such an awesome giant little kid. All right, Jensen goes ahead and shuffles everything back in. Time to go on that long yet not so long hunt for Elspeth again. I mean, is there much that Rob can do at this point, or are we just kind of uh, playing the long game towards when Jensen gets back on top? I mean, he is at a massive life total. Yeah, and I mean, he's, he's resolved a lot of revelations, too. Yeah, and I mean, look at his hand. He's just, I mean, can counter whatever he wants. Multiple copies of Dissolve, Syncopates. Yeah, why not gain 50,000 more life? That's fine. Yeah, a ton more life. He's never going to be in any sort of danger of running out of cards because he has Elixir of Immortality. Yep. Yeah, okay, and Rob's seen enough. Just grabs his cards from underneath the Dissension Sphere and picks everything up. So gives Jensen the first game win there. You can see on the screen right there in the background, we've got Andrew Cuneo, who's actually playing, I think, the same deck that Jensen is, if I'm not mistaken. So that blue-white control deck is the weapon of choice for quite a few number of players here. So let's take a look at these sideboards, see what could possibly come in from Robert, uh, try to make his game two and game three a little bit better for him. All right. So, I mean, Robert's definitely going to be bringing in uh, Dissolve. Huh. This is, he has a very interesting sideboard. So walk me through it. All right, so his sideboard is uh, a Jace Architect of Thought, uh, a couple Ultimate Prices, some Duresses, Syncopates, Dissolves, and Faraways. Um, all pretty evenly split up. And a lot of these cards are cards that you would normally want against a deck like Blue Eye Control. But he can't really bring in this many non-permanent cards and keep in his most powerful cards. So if he's going to go ahead and bring in things like Dissolve and Syncopate and Duress, then he's really going to have to leave a card like Night Vale Spectre Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, then he's really gonna have to like leave a card like like a creature uh, in a sideboard in games two and three, and that's it's just you're making cards like Master Ways much worse. Yeah, like it's very interesting. Like begs the old question of who's the beatdown. Like you've got all of these control-ish cards to bring in, but you're clearly the deck that's supposed to be the aggressor here. How much of your deck space do you dedicate to these reactive cards as opposed to the you know threats that his deck actually has? Yeah, I guess maybe he's trying to catch his opponents off guard, and 
then you know beat them in a control mirror when they think they're going to be fighting against an aggressive deck. Yeah. But the sideboard has enough cards to become a quasi control deck, but it's still going to have to play a bunch of well, permanents. I mean, let's look at the cards he could bring out. I mean, he does if he, if he chooses to playing against blue white. Tie binder mage is basically two blue mana symbols uh, attached to a two two, so it's not as good. And if he's going to be pulling cards like that, it makes Biden worse, right? If you're pulling creatures out to not have like a main source of card advantage. Or is that something that you can't actually part with from your main deck? Uh, I don't think you can part with the Biden. Okay. Um, you're playing against Esper. Yeah, so having those good. permanent sources of card advantage are too strong. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing about Biden is... It is a... Uh, it's kind of like a Jace that sits there providing uh, two devotion and card and yeah. cards. Uh, only they, they can't kill it in most ways. They can still detention spirit, but... You know, yeah, you, you can't you can't attack it with a mutavol, exactly. an Aetherling. You Which know, you can't apply pressure with Elspeth tokens. Yeah, we so. saw that happen last game too. So yeah, and that was one of the big things uh, at the Pro Tour was the, that four mana dividing point. Players having to decide between whether they're going to play with uh, Biden or whether they're going to play with Jace, and a lot of that was situational. His deck just eschews the issue and plays three of each. So with the fourth of uh, uh, Jace on the board, yeah, it's a lot of dedication to that four mana spot, especially when you consider the fact that he's also got four Master of Waves. But then again, this version of the deck does tend to be a little bit slower. Uh, I mean, he is running uh, the Cloudfin Raptors at one. He's got the Tidebinder Mage and the Frostburn Weirds at two. So he's got them. He just kind of tops out a little higher. Let's look over at uh, Huey's sideboard. He has no Judges Familiar, which is quite interesting. No. Which is actually a card that's been seen some question recently. I know that uh, Zach Kill uh, was questioning uh, on Facebook, I believe, earlier this week about whether or not that card deserved like the amount of play that it's getting right now. I've got a lot of varied responses from people. I mean, it, it, it depends. If you're playing three or more Bidens, I think it's good enough. That was actually the argument that was made. So, All right, looks like we see a first turn Thought Seize from Rob, uh, seeing a Gainsay, Pithing Needle, a pair, or is it a Detention Sphere, Sphinx's Revelation, and uh, Supreme Verdict. Supreme Verdict, so a smorgasbord of good cards. Question is, which is the most valuable for him to strip out right now? Uh, looks like he brought in at least the Far and Away, because I see one of those copies in his hand right now. He's got a Cyclonic Rift, a Dissolve, a uh, Night Veil Spectre. So looks like the Gainsay is going to come down. Uh, and it's important to note, Jensen only had two lands in his hand, although drawing that third one right there is very beneficial for him. All right, so what's Rob going to do to follow this up? And I believe I saw a Cloudfin Raptor in his hand as well. Might make its appearance right here. There it is. Looking to possibly be evolved on the following turn. Although, yeah, this window right here is going to give Rob the time that he needs to get that. Uh, ooh. Rob also didn't have a second land. I didn't catch that last turn. Ooh. And he's got to take that verdict at some point, right? Yeah, so it looks like uh, the cards that we've seen Jensen draw uh, have been a uh, Mutavault and a Supreme, or a Supreme Verdict, the, uh, the Detention Sphere are the two new additions. So let's see. He's got the Cyclonic Rift, so yeah. Looks like he's going to let him continue to ride on that uh, Supreme Verdict for a little bit while longer. <coughs> All right, Elspeth from Jensen gives him another card that he can't cast at the moment and uh, isn't a fourth land. Very important. But there's that fourth land, and Rob is still stuck on just two. Ah, there he goes. Finds that third land, but the stumble is probably going to prove costly. If he'd had all three lands that he needed, he would have actually been in a pretty reasonable situation being able to cast an Ifail Spectre and evolve that uh, Cloudfin Raptor up in the window that Jensen gave him, but now he's put himself a bit behind. Well, I mean, if he plays an Ifail Spectre, he's just playing right into Supreme Verdict that he knows about. Yeah, So good point, but he also had the Duress in his hand and had the ability to take it, so this... It's true. A lot of give and take there based on... The, the, the things would have played out differently, we can say that much at least. Definitely. Speaking of playing into Supreme Verdict, here's that Night Veil Spectre in the evolution. Yeah. 
And it looks like Jensen's tapping four mana. Likely knows what that's going to spell. So, And there it is, Supreme Verdict. Gets rid of both of the creatures. Let's see a Frostburn weird off the top there for Rob. Does he have another three drop? Follow it up with just a. It looks like he's got another Night Veil Spectre in his hand that's likely going to hit play before that, though. It's a very good one. Yep. Not a bad card to come into the void. All right. Jensen does have a lot of stuff, though. Pretty strong defense in his hand. Uh, opts against immediately removing that. Probably going to Azorius Charm it back to the top since he knows that Renault's. Uh, a little shy for mana, looking for stuff to do. Counters back. And it's the last Whisper's going to actually remove it. Again, the gain of life is absolutely meaningless, considering Jensen's going to win the game over a long, grindy set of turns. Yeah, I mean, he's he's going to win the game by attacking with a lot of Elspeth tokens and Aether Lang. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if his opponent's at 900 life or 10 life. Yep. Uh, first divination yields a land and an opportunity to cast a second divination. Filling his hand back up again. And Rolt's still stuck Just on the, so that three cards. lands, so... With this window right here, is this just going to be Elspeth? Is there any reason not to? Yep, there she is. Looks like it. So, Elspeth going to dominate this board, making three 1-1s, one all of which... Owen token wall. Just jump in front of that Frostburn weird, protect yep. the Planeswalker. <laughs> For this turn, before they start turning out massive quantities. All right, well, might as well start culling, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what Rob's thinking. But at this point, I don't even know how much it matters for him. He drew all of these really controly cards. Which, again, after sideboarding, like, if that's the card you're going to bring in, like, you forego being the aggressive deck. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, what we've seen this game is... He sideboarded out so many creatures, and then his opening hand was just a bunch of counter spells and removal spells and some discard. Yeah. And you know he disrupted Huey pretty well there, but that it, it just didn't matter because he wasn't applying any pressure on the early turns when it mattered. Yep. And if he's going to have a sideboard plan like that, he really needs to be mulliganing more aggressively. Right. Downside is there are enough cards in your deck that if you are taking out creatures, it makes them worse. Like uh, Cloudfin Raptor is the perfect example of that. We saw it hit play on the first turn and then just didn't do much for the first turns after that because he just didn't have anything to evolve it with. All right, and Huey just keeps building up the uh, the counters. I mean, Cyclonic Rift is the only answer he's got right yeah, now. But that's, that's just a, not that's a the speed best bump answer. more than anything else, especially because it had to tap out to cast it. Yeah, Huey I mean, he's just not even going to be able to counter it back on the way down. Nope. All it does is just keep it from getting too large in terms of devotion. But All right, and that attack managed to sneak through seven points of damage, dropping Rob down to 13. It's not going to take too many more of those attacks before Rob's just dead. Yeah. I mean, now there are eight tokens in play for Huey. And that fourth card, is that going to get him anything? Or fourth land, I mean. So yeah, he's got uh, two counter spells and a far and away that aren't going to do anything. Yeah, far away is not very good uh, against all these tokens. And, be, uh, uh, counter holy. magic is pretty bad when you're behind. Yeah. So <laughs> not looking very good for Rob in this spot. No. I'd be highly surprised if I didn't see a concession before too terribly much longer. I can't imagine what Rob could draw here to even provide himself an opportunity to get back in. You can't imagine? I can't imagine. I'm oh, trying. Man. I'm trying. I'm not, I have a very bad imagination. Like, <laughs> Engineer Plague? Did I come up with one? Yeah, yeah. That, that would be fine. Got it. Do you name Soldier or Owen Turtonwald in that situation? Ooh. I know. I'm bringing out the hard questions today. It's investigative journalism. I think, at its I, I, think I name Uncle. Ooh. Ooh yeah. 
preempt is fun. <laughs> I don't want him coming to Thanksgiving. All right, and that's going to do it. Looks like the handshake right. goes out, and uh, Huey Jensen takes his first game, our first match of the day, going up to a 4-0 record to start things off. It's a pretty solid way to begin your Grand Prix.